In this series of videos, we're going to move to discussing how we think about and describe the composition of substances and solutions. So here we're, we're moving into this idea of planning chemical reactions by learning how to think about measures like mass and moles and volume in terms of number of particles. So we're going to really define the mole here, um, talk about ways we indirectly measure numbers of molecules in the laboratory, how we think about numbers of molecules in different contexts, pure substances and solutions, and how we do calculations with these really core quantities of stoichiometry en route to planning chemical reactions. And so in the video series following this one, we'll really zero in on that planning a chemical reaction um, process by thinking about how much of our reactants we need to add to get a particular amount of product and, and things like this. But in order to be able to do that, we need some foundational skills and, and concepts and, and quantities to uh, use as the building blocks for that process. And we're gonna elucidate those here. So just as an outline here of, of where we're going, we're gonna start by defining what we call the formula mass, which is an important mass for a, a pure substance associated with its chemical formula. That's why it's called the formula mass. And then we'll define the mole and really talk about the mole as a concept and, and how we think about it as a counting unit and as a particularly convenient number of molecules. As arbitrary as Avogadro's number seems, it's actually a highly convenient number for um, doing stoichiometric calculations. Then we'll move into talking about how we can determine empirical and molecular formulas and, and things we can do with them. So using the mass percent composition of a compound to elucidate its empirical formula or vice versa. Then we're gonna move into talking about solutions and concentration and first the most important unit of concentration, which is molarity. And then from there, we're gonna look at other units for solution concentrations. And we'll also talk a little bit about the process of dilution and how we think about that and how we do calculations involving starting with a concentrated solution and then adding solvent to dilute it. So a lot going on in this series of videos, but these are really foundational, fundamental concepts for talking about how much type questions in chemistry. If we ever need to, to answer a question about how much of a substance do I have in front of me, the concepts we'll see here are gonna be really important to answering those questions. So the first really foundational concept that uh, I wanna introduce is called the formula mass. Now the formula mass for a pure compound, or I suppose you could define a formula mass for an atom as well, that would just be correspond to the atomic mass. But for a compound, the formula mass is the mass of a single molecule for molecular compounds or for ionic compounds, and we'll see this in more detail in a second, the mass of what we call the functional unit, which generally corresponds with the empirical formula. We calculate the formula, you know, the formula mass by simply summing or adding up all of the average atomic masses of the atoms involved. So the formula mass is used to make ca calculations about macroscopic samples, which is why we use that average atomic mass. An example of a molecular compound is shown on this slide. And if we're ever asked to calculate a formula mass, the first thing we want to do is take a look at the molecule or a given molecular formula and figure out the numbers and types of atoms involved. So the compound here is chloroform, and it has the molecular formula CHCl3. For molecular compounds, we're going to use that molecular formula to calculate the formula mass. And to do this, we simply add up all those atomic masses. So 12.01 for the carbon atom, 1.008 for the hydrogen atom. There's only one of those and then 35.45 for the chlorine, and we're going to multiply that number by three since there are three chlorines in the molecule. The total is 119.37, and the units here are actually worth thinking about briefly. The units here are atomic mass units. So for formula mass, we're thinking about it on the atomic or molecular scale, the submicroscopic scale for the time being. Once we've introduced the mole, we'll be able to take this number, the 119.37, and apply it on a macroscopic scale as well. But for the time being, let's keep that on a molecular level. What about ionic compounds? Well, ionic compounds also have a formula mass, but ionic compounds are different from molecular compounds in that they correspond to, on the, on the microscopic level or submicroscopic level, an infinite lattice of cations and anions, right? There is no discrete molecule within an ionic compound. And so there's no molecular mass that we can talk about since we're looking at an infinite lattice of cations and anions. But what we can do with an ionic compound is define a kind of functional unit that corresponds 
to the empirical formula. So, so for example, in sodium chloride, the empirical formula is NaCl with one Na for every one Cl, one Na plus cation for every one Cl minus anion. And that functional unit can be used to define or calculate the formula mass. So the empirical formula of sodium chloride is NaCl. To find the formula mass for NaCl, we add up the average atomic masses of sodium, 22.99, and chlorine, 35.45, for a total of 58.44. And here again, the units of that 58.44 are atomic mass units. And we can apply, just to foreshadow where we're going, we can apply this number at a macroscopic scale, but not until we've defined the mole, which we'll do here shortly. So now let's go ahead and, and do that. Let's define the mole. The mole is an extremely convenient counting unit for chemistry, and this is because it's really, we can think of it as a conversion factor from the submicroscopic level of atomic mass units to the macroscopic level of a gram. The mole is the number of particles that allows these two units to correspond on the macroscopic and submicroscopic levels. In order to make that work, we define the mole as a specific number of objects, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, or Avogadro's number. Of objects. Now, the mole is simply a counting unit, like a couple or a dozen or a trio, right? And so because of that, we keep what it refers to general. It can refer to absolutely anything. Atoms, molecules, ions, photons, absolutely anything. Really, atoms and molecules are the most common things we'll be referring to in chemistry, but hypothetically, it could refer to absolutely anything. It's best, though, of course, for very, very tiny things, since it's a massive number, right? Massive number of objects. And it's defined as the number of carbon-12 atoms in exactly 12 grams of pure carbon-12. And that definition give, actually gives rise to Avogadro's number. We won't go through the details of that here, but that's actually not difficult to verify on your own, and it's worth doing to really solidify the mold concept in your mind. And this is the international... Um, accepted definition for the mole. Now, a mole is a number of molecules, for example, right? And because it's a number of molecules, and molecules have different sizes and different masses, different substances have different what are called molar masses. The mass of a mole for a particular substance is different from the mass of a mole for another substance. And you can see that in the figure here. So we've got one mole of S8, C8H17OH, which is octanol, HGI2, and CH3OH, which is methanol. And if you look at the figure, we can see that there are different sizes for these four things. They all contain 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules, or in the case of the HGI2, that number of functional units, HGI2 units, within the lattice. But they're different sizes, and that's because the molecules themselves are different sizes. If you compare, for example, methanol to octanol, the methanol molecule is much smaller, and we can elucidate that from the formulas, right? One carbon here versus eight in the octanol. And unsurprisingly, a mole of methanol is smaller, takes up less volume, and has less mass than a mole of octanol. To understand, really, and, and quantify that difference, we make use of a concept called molar mass. Molar mass is the mass of one mole of a substance, and it's expressed in units of grams per mole, the number of grams in one mole of the substance. The cool thing about the way we've defined the mole this way, with this specific number, Avogadro's number of objects, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, is that it allows for the following. The following follows from this definition logically. The molar mass in grams per mole of a compound is equal to the mass of a single molecule or functional unit, in the case of an ionic compound, in atomic mass units. That's extremely convenient. That means that we can, for example, use the 58.44 AMU, that is the submicroscopic or functional unit level mass for sodium chloride as the mass of a mole as well. A mole of sodium chloride weighs 58.44 grams. Likewise with the molecular compounds, with C, 
HCl3, that 119.37 AMU, that is the weight of a single molecule of CHCl3, is the weight of a mole of CHCl3 in grams. So now we see how formula mass can be useful. Once we have the formula mass of a compound, be it molecular or ionic, we can immediately determine its molar mass. The molar mass is numerically equal to the formula mass. All we have to do is change the units from atomic mass units into grams per mole. So that's highly convenient mathematically. Now let's look at an example of how we can apply molar mass to convert or determine the number of moles of a compound we're looking at based on a given mass. And we're going to need the formula in order to do that because we need the formula mass and the molar mass in order to do this. So here's an example. Our bodies synthesize proteins from amino acids, and one of the amino acids is called glycine. It's got the molecular formula C2H5O2N. That's highlighted here because that's key information. How many moles of glycine are contained in a sample of 28.35 grams of this compound? One of the first things I encourage you to do, and we're going to do this a lot as we look at examples, is to draw a picture of the situation. This will help you get a handle on what quantities are important for solving the problem, as well as what you know and what you don't know. So here, I know that glycine is a solid. If you didn't know glycine was a solid, that's totally fine. We're basically looking at a lump of the compound, whatever its state of matter may be, that weighs 28.35 grams. What do we know about glycine? Well, glycine molecules have a particular formula mass, and that turns out in this case to be 75.07 AMUs. Now, I'll show how this is calculated in one, one second. We could, of course, add this to our picture after we've done the calculation. I've just got things a little bit out of order here, which is, I think, fine. The other thing we can realize here is that on the macroscopic scale, there is a ratio of grams to moles, the molar mass of glycine, that is a constant. And so we can think about that ratio being a constant in order to get the process started of solving the problem. That's often the hardest part in these problems, figuring out how to get started. We know, for example, that we've got 28.35 grams of a compound. That mass divided by however many moles we've got is equal to a constant, the molar mass of glycine. We don't know that number of moles. That's why I've labeled it here as x. And that's essentially what we're trying to find. But knowing that this is equal to a constant value or a value that we can figure out based on the given information helps us think about the problem mathematically, set up a mathematical equation based on the physical situation, and solve it, which is often the easiest part in problems like this. The whole process here, and in any kind of grams to moles or moles to grams conversion type problem, quote unquote, is that grams and moles are proportional to one another the constant of proportionality being the molar mass. And so here, and actually in many other contexts where we're working through stoichiometry problems, we're going to use the idea of proportional reasoning. We've got a quantity that is a proportionality constant between two units, two phenomena, two types of quantities. And we're using that constant of proportionality to set up um, a proportional equation with one unknown that we can solve for the unknown quantity. First, though, let's go back to this idea of the 75.07 AMU and where that came from. We've seen this previously, how to do this process of finding the formula mass from a given molecular formula. We saw it previously with CHCl3. Here for glycine, though, let's just quickly go through how we do this. We've got C2H5O2N. And to find the formula mass, we're going to add up the masses, the average atomic masses of all of the atoms involved in this compound. So two carbons, 12.01 five hydrogens, 1.01, .01, two oxygens, 16.00, and one nitrogen, 14.01. .01. That gets us to a total mass of 75.07 grams per mole. Now, I actually pulled a little switcheroo here, right? We were talking about the formula mass, but I used the idea that the molar mass is numerically equal to the formula mass in AMU. So the molar mass in grams per mole is numerically equal to the formula mass in AMUs, and it's 75.07 grams per mole. That 75.07 grams per mole is what this ratio is equal to. And so we can set up an equation, a proportionality equation with ratios on both sides, where the only unknown is our unknown number of moles. Solve for this using simple algebra, and we arrive at x is equal to 0 0.3776 
moles of glycine that we have in the sample. Another way to do this that is a little bit quicker but really shortcuts the physical situation, which is why I wanted to show this last, is to multiply the given mass by the inverse or the reciprocal of the molar mass. So 28.35 grams times one mole for every 75.07 .07 grams of glycine, that molar mass again, gives us the same number of moles. The math is exactly the same. It's just we didn't set it up as a proportionality. I like taking this process shown in blue because it correlates very strongly with the physical situation and points us to the molar mass as really the key proportionality constant that allows us to solve this problem.